Now with that, I'm excited to introduce our speaker for the day. Today we have Andy Ford, who is the Global Head of UX at Kimberly Clark. Now Andy is no stranger to the Figma community. He's spoken at our Design Leaders Meetup and is also featured in one of our blog posts. There are probably a million challenges to scale very, very large design teams. So I'm excited for what Andy's gonna share with us today. Please give him a warm Figma welcome and over to you, Andy. Awesome, thank you very much. All right, well, I'm gonna do some, uh, some screen sharing here and we will hop right into it. All right, are you guys able to see my screen? Yep, we see it. Awesome, okay, cool. All right, well, first and foremost, I want to um, give a little shout out to Clara and Vanessa. They have been great uh, as we ran through this and we were kind of framing up what this discussion was gonna look like. Uh, they asked me, they're like, well, what, you know, do you intend for people to be able to get out of this? And at the end of the day, I said, I wish there were somebody like me to be able to provide some guidance on uh, some of the lessons that we have learned here in terms of what um, we've had to traverse. And so uh, my hope is that for all of you, first and foremost, thank you for making some time uh, here today. And hopefully you're able to glean some insights from uh, a lot of road that we've traveled and, uh, and be able to take a lot of that to your own organizations and to be able to have some insights about potentially what the, uh, the road ahead looks like. So let me uh, real quick just do a, a background on Kimberly Clark. Uh, you can kind of see the uh, NASCAR sponsorship that we've got there with Cottonelle. We uh, make a lot of uh, great products you've probably heard of before in the form of Huggies, Kotex, Kleenex, Cottonelle, the pen, pull-ups, little swimmers, Viva, Scott Towels, the list goes on and on. We are a global organization. We are somewhere in the neighborhood of about 46,000 employees uh, globally. We're in 175 countries. Um, and I think the cool thing about Kimberly Clark is that uh, statistically anywhere between a quarter to a third of the world's population touches a Kimberly Clark product on a daily basis. So we're big. And with that uh, scale comes a lot of, uh, a lot of unique challenges. Um, so I lead the UX team uh, for Kimberly Clark. We brought Figma into the organization uh, in late 2019. So we've been on this journey with them you know, for about two and a half years now and have learned a lot of things along the way. Uh, first and foremost, if you're not currently working with Figma, um, you know, I would highly encourage you to. Uh, really great people. Uh, we have really kind of received, you know, excellent, excellent attention treatment, you know, uh, and those types of things. So, you know, from my perspective, when I look at who we work with from, from, from a vendor perspective, you know, really kind of having a lot of great people to work with uh, is, is certainly uh, key to all of that and, and helps to make a lot of this uh, go a lot better. Um, and so with that, I will dive into uh, the road that we've traveled and, uh, and talk about some of the things that we've learned and then talk about kind of where that led us to currently so that you guys have uh, some sort of an indication as to some things that you might need to think about uh, in terms of bringing Figma into your organization or at a point where you may be kind of like us, where this thing exploded uh, in terms of popularity. And then, uh, you know, a lot of the realities that you're going to have to sort of navigate when that happens. So let me talk about uh, first and foremost, uh, lessons learned. So like I said, we brought Figma into the organization back in 2019. And a lot of the challenges that we have are that we have multiple and many different work streams. So going back to uh, what was mentioned previously, we have 500 and over 550 digital property properties worldwide. So you think about all those brands that I just listed in the 175 countries, and you can see how these things uh, you know, multiply very quickly. And so we've got a lot of different work that's taking place. Uh, a lot of it originates uh, internally uh, with the UX team. We also work with a lot of external agencies and lot of other organizations in general. And so we've always just got a lot of work that is going on in general. And so what we needed to do as we began to walk with Figma and we began to really kind of see what, uh, how we needed to get organized, we really kind of needed to templatize the way that we were doing it. And so what we, we've done from an organizational standpoint is to really kind of be able to start to frame up uh, the way and uh, areas that uh, work is going to land based on geography. So 
for the most part, uh, it was really kind of, uh, the, I guess, the easiest place for us to start was to kind of look at uh, how we're going about tackling this work from a regional perspective. So if you think about the four corners of the earth, that's kind of how we are organized as well. And so we just needed to find ways to really kind of, uh, you know, make sure that we are, we're organized and credit to a lot of the people on my team in terms of uh, really kind of giving some thought as to, as to how that was going to work. And so, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the thing that you're going to have to be able to do is be able to find this work so that you can reuse it. Uh, be able to share it, uh, whatever the case may be, you know, six months from now, if somebody comes to you and they go, hey, where's that thing that you were working on? You know, you need an ability to be able to, uh, to find it quickly, you know, and so, you know, uh, as you begin to think about, you know, how things are going to scale, uh, think about how you want to be organized first and foremost, because when you get to this point where six months down the line, somebody's asking for something, you've got a way to be able to, uh, to easily find it. So just know that if you're in an organization where you've got a lot of moving parts and pieces, you know, a lot of that upfront strategy is going to make your life a lot easier uh, in terms of um, what the road ahead is going to look like. Now, for us, in terms of like what this means from a global design perspective, again, we have a lot of people we work with, uh, either internal or, uh, or external. And so for us, when we brought Figma into the organization, we started to use it, you know, as a design tool, then we started to use it for prototyping, then we started using it for testing of the prototyping and that sort of thing. And so what happened is um, we had a lot of editors that uh, all of a sudden um, popped on the platform. And uh, I was conscious of this sort of in the back of my mind. But uh, at the same time, uh, you know, as we began to start to put a lot more focus on this, here recently, uh, we started to realize we have had quite the explosion. And so one of the things I would say is to keep an eye on these things. Uh, you know, for the most part, uh, in our particular case, you know, it was one of those things where we had a lot of people who had editor licenses. We didn't necessarily need an editor license. And so I think, you know, going into it, it's good to start to have some awareness of who really kind of needs what uh, and to be able to kind of lay out sort of a framework for everyone up front as well so that they understand truly what they need and really kind of how you, uh, you know, sort of ingratiate uh, users into the platform itself. The other thing, too, is that we've got just a tremendous amount of work that's taken place. So uh, if you think about, again, 550 websites, typically there's probably about 20 to 30 of those that are uh, you know in, in the markets and the brands that, that we work with that are probably the most active so if you think about going through and doing like full-on you know app design website design we do a lot of enterprise design as well those screens are going to add up you know and those files are going to add up and everything's just going to begin to uh, to scale and so you know, keep in mind the amount of volume of work uh, that's taking place in your organization as well. And ultimately what that led us to is really kind of the need for governance. And so we're actually really just kind of getting started on our journey in terms of what that looks like. But as part of this process, we're not the only design team uh, inside of Kimberly Clark. So we've got other design teams that we work with as well. They're a little bit smaller, they're a little bit more spread out, but at the end of the day, uh, they hopped on the platform and they're a factor as well, you know? And so it's one of those things where we really kind of need to craft uh, sort of a collaborative vision uh, in terms of what this looks like and how we want to scale it uh, throughout the organization. Because again, it just kind of went like, uh, you know, through the roof. And so we really kind of needed a way to really kind of rethink a lot of that. So for us, you know, we've got a lot of uh, global brands. And so we needed to really kind of be able to start to move in a direction where we get a lot of this connected. So as I mentioned, we've got other uh, design groups that are inside the organization. What this ultimately led to is that we started had, having to build a lot more uh, closer relationships with the, uh, with the overall uh, broader design uh, organization. And two, what it has really kind of began to make us really think about is how we need to uh, spin up design systems at scale. So a lot of the ways that we had approached this in the past was that we had a certain site that we were working on with a certain uh, brand and a certain uh, region. And so we'd go and we'd spin up a design system for that. And then we'd have same brand in another region and we'd go spin up a design system for that. And so as you can imagine, 
we had a ton of design systems. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, now we're starting to think, rethink the way that we've approached design systems because design systems, much like I had mentioned uh, before with the files and those sorts of things can begin to get uh, quite, um, quite out of control as well. And so now we're starting to think about you know, how do we branch design systems? We had a discussion this morning where we're talking about headless design systems. Uh, so it really kind of just depends, uh, you know, based on your situation. In our particular case, because we just have so many brands and we have so many sites that, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're having to really kind of come to terms with the reality that these things can get, uh, these things get quite complex fairly quick, you know. And so at the end of the day, there are a number of different approaches to design systems. My recommendation would be that you really kind of give some thought as to the type of organization that you're in and, and really kind of what's going to work best. So now we're moving towards a, an enterprise uh, plan. And as part of that uh, overall, uh, you know, one of the things that I think has been sort of a, a, an upside to a lot, of, a lot of this is that other, you know, leaders have wanted to be a part of that journey as well. So we have, for example, like I'd mentioned, kind of other design groups here uh, inside the organization. We also have an innovation group uh, as well. Uh, they're usually kind of poking and pressing on some things. And, uh, and, and so what that's really kind of allowed us to do is to really kind of um, pre pre present a lot more opportunities uh, throughout the organization in terms of uh, where we can leverage Figma. So I think a lot of groups have really kind of seen a lot of upside and benefit uh, to working in the ways that we work. Uh, and so they're really kind of wanting to become part of that uh, as well. And so that's even led to another discussion about, you know, how we really scale Figma inside the enterprise to become more of a collaborative tool uh, that others can use. Typically, it's kind of one of those things that's, uh, you know, it's very sort of designer uh, heavy, designer led, that sort of thing. But even with uh, products like FigJam, for example. It's a collaboration platform. Anybody can jump in and start using. And so when we start working with a lot of our other teams, there are other aspects to Figma that really kind of parlay into a lot of the work that we're doing. And so again, you know, uh, just thinking a little bit more broader in terms of context, think about, you know, others inside the organization that might benefit from uh, Figma as well. And really, you know, uh, try to roll out the red carpet as much as you're able to, to, to really kind of help them understand, you know, how to use the tool, where and when, you know, and that sort of thing as well. And as I just mentioned, you know, uh, for us, uh, design systems at scale has begun to become something that uh, we're, we're needing to kind of rethink. I think ideally what we're, we ideally would like would be able to have uh, sort of this this backbone of a design system that we can branch. You would have all your core components in there, the things that you would typically expect. But with us, because we've got so many different brands, we need to kind of be able to branch those in different ways to really kind of be able to, uh, to make this thing as flexible as possible. I had worked at a previous uh, large organization where um, before they were called design systems, they had this concept of a design system and it had gotten to the point that it was very rigid and inflexible, at which point they pretty much kind of had to break the, the mold and, and kind of start all over again, you know. So again, just give some thought as to, uh, you know, the scale of your design systems, where they're going to get plugged in, who's going to be using them, you know, and those sorts of things that will, uh, I think, really kind of, uh, you know, give you some, some pointers in terms of, um, of how you want to set up your design systems. So for us, uh, a lot of this really kind of boils down to our workspaces uh, as business units. So in terms of the way that we're set up today, as I kind of mentioned, it's more so regional. We kind of have, uh, you know, you think about it in terms of what region and then what brand and then what project and that, that sort of thing. Ultimately, what I think we're going to wind up doing is rethinking that in terms of one, just from an organizational structure and the, and the way that we're going is to really kind of start to align these things, say a little bit more so to say like business unit versus region, uh, in which case then, you know, we'd be able to go into say uh, for us, like a, a business unit, for example, would be uh, baby and child care, which is going to be 
huggies, pull-ups, good nights. And so when we think about uh, our business units and the brands that are aligned uh, within there, uh, that should then make it a lot easier for one, to be able to have design resources who are dedicated to these specific uh, business units. And then two, you know, as we kind of start to move towards maybe a little bit more of a, a global type of approach per se, um, it allows us to be a little bit more agnostic as to regions and really kind of be able to focus on the brands themselves. So you can kind of see here, even in our own journey, you know, uh, you're gonna have to have some checks and balances along the way. You're just gonna have to sit there and kind of reflect on where you're at, where things are trending. And, you know, I think overall, just uh, be as flexible as you can and really kind of give some thought as to uh, what the road ahead is gonna look like. Because for us, and hopefully this is the big takeaway from, from this, is that, you know, a lot of these things we had to figure out, you know, we were building the parachute on the way down, so to speak. So we had this uh, explosive growth that happened uh, throughout the organization. And there were really kind of two things that we really needed to address. One, first and foremost, is protecting our IP. So uh, we've got, again, a lot of external uh, agencies and organizations that we work with. Uh, they don't need access to, you know, the full extent of everything that we're doing. They may just be focused on, you know, one particular thing. So in that sense, you know, uh, really kind of give some thought as to how you're going to bring users into the organization and, uh, you know, plant them where they need to, to be focused so that they don't get into other things, mess up files and, and, and do all sorts of other things that are gonna cause a lot of headache. And then the other thing is that uh, just general uh, platform and tooling change management. I've got a link here to an article uh, that uh, is on uh, Figma's blog. It was actually done, I think a couple of years ago, I wanna say, and it talks about how we brought uh, Figma into the organization. For us, it really kind of boiled down to a few simple things. Uh, one, we had been on some other competitor platforms. Uh, one, they were kind of proprietary to a certain type of hardware. Uh, what we found out is that we cannot uh, uh, make the assumption that everybody is going to be on a nice brand new Mac. Um, a lot of, lot of the, the groups that we work with offshore are, are on PCs and there's nothing they can do about that. So. Uh, so we needed to be very much platform uh, agnostic in that sense. And then, uh, and then the other thing was that we also then had this disparate kind of feature tool uh, where the pricing started to get a little out of control and, uh, and we needed something that was a little bit more affordable. And then, um, and then really the straw that broke the camel's back is that we had a person on the team who had all of this work uh, that was on her hard drive and her hard drive had become corrupted and we had no backup. So uh, at that point, uh, when all those things added up, I said, okay, well, we've got to make a move to something that's cloud-based so we're not losing work. Uh, we have something that's you know just very straightforward in terms of pricing. And then, as I kind of mentioned before, I think, you know, a lot of the benefit and the upside is that the people at Figma are really great. So uh, I work with a lot of vendors, um, you know, and they vary quite a bit. Um, and I will say that the, the people at, at Figma are, are really awesome. So, uh, you know, they're, they're going to be they're going to be very helpful in terms of uh, managing this. I have had other people who have approached me and they said, uh, how did you bring Figma into the organization? I think in our particular situation, we were fortunate because we were just kind of getting started on this path. I think other design leaders I've spoken with are kind of locked in a, a ecosystems that they don't have a whole lot of flexibility. But I would say that, you know, just use my own story as, as, as a bit of a, a testament as to, um, you know, how you bring something into the organization and, uh, and really kind of be able to spin it up and scale it, you know taking into account all the things that I've mentioned as well, uh, in terms of how you're gonna be organized, how you're gonna go about work, how you're gonna be able to provide access to others, uh, and really just keep a lot of oversight in terms of, of everything that's going on. I think for us, the one, I guess, upside uh, for a lot of that is that I had to go through and really kind of start to take a lot deeper look at a lot of the work that was taking place here. And uh, the great thing is, is that I discovered a lot of good things that are going on, you know, 
So, uh, so I would say, you know, from a grooming standpoint, probably helps to really kind of keep an eye as to uh, an eye as to uh, everything that's uh, currently going on, so that uh, you got an idea as to uh, all the work that that's taking place under under your roof. So what that's led us to is that we really have needed to put a lot of emphasis and focus as we stand today uh, in terms of governance. So uh, first and foremost, we need flexible access. So again, we work with a lot of different types of organizations, both internal and external. Uh, you know, uh, we need it to be very simple and easy for users to be able to get the access that they need and at the same time, make sure they have the right access that they need. Uh, so since we have a lot of uh, multiple and complex design systems, we want everybody to be able to plug into those things very simply and easily uh, so that they can get spun up and going uh, very quickly. Uh, certainly at the pace that I think all of us want to move at, you know, as quickly as possible, uh, you know, just reducing the amount of friction is just going to make life a lot easier for everybody. Uh, so what we've needed to move to, though, is that, again, that adoption of a permissions-based uh, process model. So that's one where, uh, you know, we, we've got to really kind of put some constraints in place so that uh, those who need access uh, have access, they have the right level of access. Uh, and again, they're kind of, you know, dropped into a container so that, uh, for the most part, they're really kind of uh, only accessing the things that they really need. Uh, and, you know, prevents, you know, other headaches down the line as part of that. And then, you know, overall, from, a, from an admin level, you know, uh, we need to look at things from, from that management perspective. And so right now, what we're going to do is set up some quarterly touch points so that, again, all these other design leaders throughout the organization and really anybody else who we work with, we've got that ability to sort of have some checks and balances in place to really kind of be able to say, okay, here's where we're at. What are we doing well? What needs improvement? Uh, how do we really kind of double down on the strengths, minimize the weaknesses and that sort of thing. And so, you know, from that perspective, I think it is healthy for us to have these moments in time where we kind of, uh, you know, uh, reflect upon uh, where we've been and where we need to go. There's discussion right now within our organization as to how we really scale uh, Figma beyond just what design teams are leveraging it for. And so that's a healthy discussion that we need to have um, because we certainly want to invite more people to be able to collaborate on the platform and then to just reduce the number of platforms that we're using as well. And so, um, you know, for us again, this is we're on a we're on a we're on a, a, a journey here of continual growth. So yeah, again, I kind of have already touched upon uh, the need for uh, us to really kind of think about what internal and external teams are doing uh, with the platform. Um, and so again, you know, not only think about you know just your immediate design teams, but also think about you know external external groups that that are going to need access as well. We have an onboarding process, you know, uh, so for anybody who we bring on board, for example, uh, I'm speaking more so to, to the internal teams, we have videos and things that we've set up around our design systems so that they know how to, what our ways of work look like. Same type of thing for external teams. If we've got some groups who we're going to bring on sort of long term, uh, we really kind of want to be able to help to get them up and going as quickly as possible. So uh, some folks on my team have gone through and really kind of designed some very robust design systems. And uh, as part of that, you know, uh, we just want to make it easy for everybody to get in and be able to start doing work and carrying out, you know, a lot of things that we're looking to do here at Kimberly Clark. Uh, and you're going to need to be able to provide those design systems at scale. So in our case, you know, again, 175 countries, uh, we have um, you know, left to right in terms of the way that link languages are uh, read. And then we also have right to left. Uh, it's very easy to be able to say some things, you know, within about two or three words in English. It may be two to three sentences in, in, in other languages. So, you know, uh, in terms of flexibility, uh, you really kind of need to be able to have design systems that scale, you know, in that sense. 
And then the other thing that we're really focusing on, this has been something that we've been working on since uh, about the middle part of last year, is really what that designer to developer workflow is going to look like. So we don't have very ma many internal development teams here at KC. So a lot of the groups that we work with are external. And a lot of times they're different external teams. Uh, and they are also in all four corners of the earth as well. So we've got a lot of different groups that we work with. Uh, and I, I would say for us, when I look at things from my perspective, uh, I have to really kind of take into consideration things that are going to affect performance. And so when we initially started, we thought, okay, well, this is great. We have inspect mode, we'll hand it off to our developers and uh, they can run with it from there. We realized there was a lot of education that was needed uh, to really kind of help them understand how to make all that work. And with development teams, you know, it's, uh, it can be a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, we have certain groups that we've worked with, for example, who have been able to really kind of uh, nail it, you know, from a pixel perfection standpoint. And then we have others that uh, it's just a bit more of a challenge, let's put it that way. Uh, and so what we needed to do is really kind of understand what a lot of those uh, workflows look like and how we can begin to optimize them. We've got a third party tool that we're introducing into this uh, discussion that really kind of packages up everything that is in uh, inspect mode from a front end development standpoint with a lot of that uh, CSS code uh, that then uh, pipes into uh, their development platforms and really kind of minimizes a lot of that overhead guesswork having to eye the design uh, and translate that into uh, development. And so the other benefit to that too is that much like design systems, uh, for the most part, it saves a lot of overhead uh, for developers as well. And so, uh, and so that's really kind of another uh, factor uh, as far as all this is concerned is that while you may be focused on everything that you're trying to drive out from a design standpoint, it then has to move on somewhere else, you know? And as part of that, you know, I noticed that we were spending quite a bit of time in QA and it was creating a lot of drag on the team. And so we needed to really kind of find some ways to, to optimize a lot of, uh, of what we're doing. Um, so with that, one of the things I wanna do is really kind of showcase some of the work that we've done here recently. I'm gonna use Huggies uh, in our design system that we've got for Huggies to really kind of be able to showcase uh, how we have approached this. Now, granted, there's many different ways you could go about this. So, you know, this is, this is our approach. And again, we're kind of starting to rethink some of this as well. Uh, I'd say one of the things that we noticed going through a lot of this was that um, there were a lot of things that, uh, you know, these files can, can tend to get, you know, bloated fairly quickly. And so we're even looking at ways that we can go through and, and sort of optimize uh, our current approach. But, uh, but overall, you can kind of see here in terms of the way that the, um, the file and the file structure is laid out. It's a lot of things that you would kind of expect, you know, so up front, we've just got some basics in terms of like, you know, here's how you get started. Here's how you jump into this again, you know, sort of think about the fact that we do work with a lot of external groups. So we need to be able to have some primers to be able to get them in uh, up and going uh, fairly quickly. And then we just kind of break it down into a lot of the, uh, you know, the basics. So uh, going back to the theory of atomic uh, design, you know, we're really kind of seeing that uh, play out in terms of, um, of everything that we've got framed up here from, from a design system standpoint. So we recently just relaunched uh, this site, uh, I think about a month ago. And so you can see where in particular, you know, a lot of, uh, of the, the, the things that were designed uh, in general, uh, you know, made their way uh, through our design system. And so as we go through and we continue the improvement of this uh, digital property, we have a way to kind of go back and reconcile a lot of that. So you can kind of see some of those elements that uh, I was just showing a moment ago. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, you know, um, we were kind of guilty of doing a little bit of set it and forget it. And so one of the things now that we're starting to do is put a lot more focus on continual improvement. 
as such, you know, we may not have the same people who were working on this previously. And if that's the case, then we really kind of need some ways for them to be able to jump in, get up and going very quickly, uh, be able to access uh, the design systems, to drive out a lot of what they're doing. And the other thing too, it's a component of this is just overall governance. So inevitably, you know, while the design looks like this today, uh, things may change. So where we sit inside the organization, uh, we kind of really pick up everything from a program level that's driven out up top from a design direction standpoint. And these are really kind of the folks who are thinking about the brand in general. Um, they're working with a lot of our agencies, uh, really kind of setting a lot of the, the direction and the tone and those sorts of things. We had a Super Bowl commercial that came out uh, last year. And that really kind of prompted a lot of the evolution of the brand in terms of where it's at today, in terms of this look and feel and, and those sorts of things. And those are going to evolve over time, you know. And so with that being the case, while we may be making periodic adjustments, uh, you know, uh, for short durations of time, ultimately, you know, about every two or three years, these things go through an evolution. And so as such, you know, we're going to need for our design systems to be able to uh, be able to bend and flex uh, as well. And so when you think about everything that I've spoken about here, you know, ultimately for us, this is kind of where a lot of these, these land. So again, this is just one of 550. Um, and so you know, there's a lot of moving parts and pieces. And so hence the reason that it's important for, uh, you know, uh, having a strategy going into this, really thinking about how you're going to do design at scale, uh, ultimately where this is going to land, and then two, you know, how you're going to continually improve upon it. So uh, for us, one of the things that I I really kind of um, impressing on us to do is, is really kind of keeping a lot of focus on what's happening with the performance of these digital properties. So then we start to get into where we're uh, tying back into everything from an analytics perspective, a performance perspective, those sorts of things. We have some things that are going well. We have some things inevitably that we're going to need to improve. And so when we go back and we think about that continual improvement uh, loop, that's one where uh, we've got to be able to make adjustments fairly easily. And ultimately, it's going to go back through the same cycles. We're still going to have, you know, developers who are going to have to develop and that sort of thing. But ultimately, we want to create, you know, um, a very easily approachable uh, system that allows us to be able to drive out, uh, you know, speed to market. So how do we get a lot of this great design uh, out as quickly as possible? And then two, where we need to go back and maybe course correct or whatever the case may be. Uh, we've got that ability to do so in a highly flexible format and one that uh, allows us to really kind of keep an eye on the future. We're just going to continue to do more and more of this. We're going to continue to work with more and more uh, groups. And, uh, you know, as such, we really kind of have to have a lot of our ducks in a row, so to speak, so that we can, uh, we can really kind of make, make life a lot easier for, for all of us. So for us, I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up here and then we can uh, get into a little QA. So for us, we, really, we just, again, we just need to streamline a lot of our processes. Uh, what that means for us is that we're going to realize some optimizations as part of that, cost being one of them. Uh, again, we do work with a lot of uh, external groups, so, uh, so there is cost that's associated with that. Uh, we needed to remove a lot of repetitive tasks. Uh, for us, it kind of meant a really we were at a point where we we're doing the same things over and over and over again. Uh, again, 175 markets, you know, 550 websites, that sort of thing. We were doing a lot of the same things over and over and over again. So we needed to find some ways to really kind of be able to streamline that. Uh, one of the keys to that, again, is going to be that designer to developer handoff and how we optimize uh, those processes. And then in general, uh, really kind of thinking about this more so from a governance perspective. Again, we brought Figma into the organization. It was great. Uh, we were leveraging it to drive out a lot of the design work that we're doing, prototyping, testing, all that sort of stuff. And then it just went through the roof. And so, uh, you know, as part of that, while that is 
a great problem to have. It's still a challenge that, uh, you know, uh, caught us a little off guard, to be completely honest. And it was the type of thing that, um, you know, we needed to really kind of start to put some focus on in terms of what governance looks like uh, moving forward so that we can, again, kind of move through these things in a very streamlined manner to, uh, to really kind of, you know, increase speed to market, friction, less friction for everybody involved and uh, help us to drive out, you know, better products at the end of the day. Awesome. I'll cap it at that. Hand it back. Thanks so much for sharing, Andy. Um, the Q&A is blowing up, so let's just jump into it. I have some of them on my slide deck, so I'll go ahead and share that. Um, now, you shared a ton of considerations with this move. There's so many moving pieces. I'm curious to hear more about some of those challenges that came with this twin change. What were some of those things that popped up? Yeah, I would say for the most part, really kind of uh, know your team. So for us, uh, it was kind of one of those things where I had used Figma in a previous organization. And so we kind of tiptoed into it a little bit. But at the same time, I realized that for the most part with our design team, it wasn't going to be that much of a stretch. I mean, they understood the basic concepts in general. Then you start to get into some of the nuances in terms of the ways that you spin up design systems how you're going to do a lot of that designer to develop or handoff and that sort of thing. And so I think for the most part, one, just know your team. You know, uh, if you know your team, I think that's going to make things a lot easier to be able to introduce it. We kind of did it, you know, sort of in a soft launch, so, so to speak. You know, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, hey, guys, if you want to, you know, go use this. And so they started to gravitate towards it uh, slowly wasn't one of those things where I said, okay, guys, we're, you know, uh, lying in the sand and, uh, you know, from this point forward, this is the way we've got to go. So it just kind of happened organically over time. I would say with anything you do, typically speaking, probably be best to just start with a small group of people, uh, see how it goes. And then if all goes well, then uh, begin thinking about scaling it from there. But uh, yeah, overall, you know, I would say just know, know your team. If you know your team, then I think that's going to make it a lot easier. Yeah, I love that personalized approach just because I hear that question on how to implement Figma a lot. And oftentimes it just starts with knowing what the needs are and what the pain points are first. Otherwise it's hard to address anything. And so yeah, I love that point. All right, our next question from Austin, Cole, and more, what's the name of the third-party integration you're using in your dev workflows? Zero Height. So uh, Zero Height is uh, a tool that, like I said, it, a platform, I should say, that uh, packages up a lot of that uh, front-end code that Figma generates. Uh, it had been, you know, like I'd mentioned, the type of thing where uh, our developers, some of them knew you could go into inspect mode, copy and paste the CSS, Others didn't, and so uh, and so we noticed there was a lot of disconnect in terms of the things that we were looking at, and so we piloted this last year with uh, some of our internal teams, and uh, I didn't know what to expect from a results uh, standpoint, to be completely honest. But when I saw that they were recreating exactly what we had designed, that into itself was uh, a, a bit of a groundbreaking moment. Uh, and then two, you know, now we're starting on this journey uh, to move, you know, in that manner. But one of the things I asked our developer what, at the time as he had gone through this, I said, you know, how much time did this save you? And he was like, yeah, roughly about two or three days. And, um, and so uh, if you think about that, we touch probably about 100 sites per year. So two to three days per site, all of a sudden we're starting to shave off like years, you know, of time uh, in terms of how we get to market. Yeah, oh, awesome. Ryan asks, do you have a dedicated centrally located design system team? If so, how many associates work on systems? We do not have necessarily a dedicated centrally located design system team. Uh, one of the things that I have really kind of... Um, been preaching to our group is for everybody to learn design systems. Uh, so anybody who on the team, I guess, uh, let me back up. I'll, I'll say this, our internal uh, teams really kind of work on design systems, but it's not, there's not a specific team uh, that's working on it. The main thing I have 
encourage everybody to do is to learn how to spin up design systems, know how they work. We did uh, craft, I guess you could say a template per se, and we have everybody basically kind of copy and paste that template. But I think, you know, that's where we're starting to get to a point now where we really do need to create a central design system that we can branch. You know, we'll use a button, for example, a button may be red on Huggies, it may be green on Depend, it may be purple on pull-ups, you know. But at the end of the day, a button's a button. And so uh, it'd be ideal if we were to move to something where, you know, we've got something that perhaps branches or in the case, if we look at something that's maybe headless, for example, we have all of those components. So it really just depends on how complex your design systems are going to be. Um, but I would say for the most part, really just encourage everybody to learn the principles of atomic design, how that relates to design systems, and then really kind of how you can uh, integrate that into your own workflows. Yeah, totally. Just being systems minded for every IC to sort of have that integrated in their workflow. Totally agree. Now, this one is sort of related to this question more into the technical setup with BUs. Is each design system, so like Huggies and each of those brands managed by a centralized team per BU? So like a Huggies design system team and then another brand design system team uh, versus global, which you, which you mentioned you don't have. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, we'll see how this goes, but I think we'll wind up moving in that direction. Um, so again, you know, Huggies is Huggies. Um, now granted, it's portrayed in many different languages, but mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, you know, the brand is the brand, you know, and we need for it to really look consistent, you know, from a global perspective. There are nuances, you know, uh, from that perspective. So not everything kind of is a one-to-one -one per se, but, uh, but there are definitely, I think, you know, in terms of the way that we're beginning to move, I think it is going to start to look a little bit more like this. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this question from Ashley and Laura, how do you use Figma as a design system as opposed to a style guide? <laughs> so we do technically have style guides here. Those are, as I kind of mentioned previously, you know, uh, at the program level, uh, those groups really kind of drive out, uh, they call they call them their brand identity guidelines. So that really kind of is the, the overall uh, style guide. We pick up a lot of those brand assets and then translate them into digital. And so for us, that's really kind of where a design system uh, comes into play. But now we're starting to move beyond just it being, uh, you know, a centralized repository of assets to now needing to really kind of leverage it for the development side of things as well. And so uh, as far as all that's concerned, you know, um, all right, we already have these brand identity guidelines, which is the same thing as a style guide. Uh, but for us, design systems really kind of translates more into everything that we're doing from a digital perspective. So again, we just spin it up for anybody who is going to work with us. Uh, but then, you know, as I mentioned, kind of the next step here is uh, what that designer to develop our handoff uh, looks like. And so from that perspective, you know, we really are uh, beginning to use uh, Figma in the form of uh, being able to leverage design systems versus just a reference for like a style guide type thing. Because a lot of these things now, as we're starting to get into this designer to develop our handoff, the naming conventions that we have for components, uh, the ways that we're leveraging design tokens, for example, is all going to become much more important. And so in that sense, we're going to be able to really kind of leverage Figma as a true design system uh, from that perspective. Yeah, totally. Now, I think this audience loves all things design systems. So we've got more design system questions coming. How do you handle multi-branded design systems with different themes and styles, but still keep components connected globally? So I think that's probably something that, again, is kind of um, right now, the way we've, we've done it in terms of our, our overall evolution, is we spun up design systems uh, for each brand and, again, kind of uh, for each region uh, for the most part. Uh, a lot of them have a lot of similarities uh, in terms of overall uh, themes and styles. There are some nuances based on market, but uh, 
But overall, uh, in terms of like keeping these components connected globally to a core component library. So for the most part, we're really kind of getting to think about this, uh, you know, theory of branching uh, per se. Uh, I would say that's probably some work that we need to do. I think what we've done up to this point is that we really kind of stretched the limit of a design system uh, in terms of like how big these files can get. And I think one of the things that we're starting to learn is that, uh, you know, we've got to figure out some ways to really kind of optimize that. So uh, that could take on some different forms moving forward. Those are some things that we're, we're really thinking about, you know, at this point in time. But I mean, ultimately, yes, we would. Ideally, my vision was initially, well, and we'll see how feasible this is, that so we just stand up basically this core backbone of a design system, and then we just branch it based on uh, whatever the, uh, the, the brand is. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely a challenge. I hear this question come up time and time again, and I think those really large organizations are still working through this. Next up, just going back to the beginning of your journey, you shared so much. Um, ben is wondering what were you using before Figma, and how much effort was getting how much effort was there in getting those existing assets into Figma. <laughs> So we were using sort of your standard suite of tools, uh, things that are currently out there in the marketplace. Uh, I think we're all familiar with them. Um, and I think the thing that, uh, you know, in terms of like how much effort was there, you know, to get existing assets uh, into Figma, uh, for the most part, uh, wasn't, I mean, we were kind of at a point where we were starting from scratch. I mean, we had done a lot of work and it existed in a lot of these other platforms and whatnot. But I think at the end of the day, when we kind of looked at it, it was one of those things where, you know, uh, we realized we were kind of basically starting with a clean slate. So there really, to be honest, it wasn't much that we wanted to actually leverage from existing tools. I think we really kind of just wanted to, to start from scratch. But I will say this, it is relatively easy to get a lot of those um, things into Figma. So if you are coming from other platforms, uh, in particular, if those assets are already in a vector format, uh, it's not gonna be a stretch for you to be able to uh, get them implemented into Figma. Um, I would say for the most part, you know, those things should be relatively easy. Um, and I think the, the, the key thing is to really kind of think about what your strategy is going to look like, what the road ahead is going to look like, because this this stuff should be relatively um, low level, uh, so to speak. You're going to really kind of need to think about, you know, what the road ahead is going to look like. Yeah, some of that long term governance, which you sort of mentioned earlier. Yeah, totally. It's not just the actual asset, but all the workflows that surround being in this new ecosystem. All right, next one. So we have a question, the terms like headless design system and management to admin, those are just really large enterprise challenges. Do you have mindset issues at the management level? And can you explain how you deal with that? <laughs> I guess we're a little fortunate in that we don't. Um, you know, for the most part, uh, we really kind of get I guess we're fortunate in the, in the respect that we kind of really got, you know, the, the ability to really kind of, you know, call our own shots, uh, so to speak, you know. Um, but, you know, in terms of like uh, mindset issues at management levels and, and, and those sorts of things, I think for us, I mean, the key thing is, is that we show one, how you speed to market, you know. Uh, so if we spin up some very optimized design systems, how can we get all this work done a lot faster, you know, so I think if you're trying to make an argument in terms of, of, of those types of things, Figma certainly is, is great at that. Um, you know, and the other thing, too, is that we use a lot of that for our testing. You know, so we've got uh, testing platforms. We put a lot of this out in front of our users. We're doing a lot of that testing validation, that sort of thing. Great thing is Figma pipes in uh, quite seamlessly with a lot of these platforms. So, you know, I would say overall, uh, you know, the, the key thing for us has been that we've just found ways to optimize doing a lot of the work, you know. So uh, so for us, I, I think, you know, the key thing is, is that uh, we're just able to get things going a lot faster than we had ways we had been doing this in the past, which creates a lot less friction. And, uh, you know, for us, we've got a lot, we've got to, we've got to, 
uh, conquer, you know, on any given day. And so for us, we, we've got to find optimized ways to go about doing that. Yeah, definitely. Last couple of questions here. How closely do your designers work with brand designers and what is that working relationship like? Great question. So on the one hand, up until recently, we had not been working very closely with uh, the, the, the folks that really kind of drive out a lot of that uh, design direction uh, from a programmatic level. Um, we've had a few things that have occurred uh, here where we have needed to button up a lot of uh, things that uh, we, we cross paths on. Um, and as a result of that, that has inherently kind of forced us to have to uh, work a lot more closely together. It had always been my vision that we would work very closely with them. Uh, but now we're starting to see where all of that really has an impact. So on the one hand, uh, our brand, you got to think about us, uh, our organization, we're a 150 year old company. We're very traditional in terms of, you know, a lot of what our media spend looks like. Digital is still a relatively, you know, new thing here. Uh, Again, 150 year old company, relatively speaking. And so, what does that working relationship look like? So, now we're at a point where we have had to tighten up a lot of this, and they can see the implications of these things from where they start at the program level to where they land uh, on our websites, you know. And so, we've got to have the ways to be able to tighten a lot of that up so that, uh, you know, a lot of what they're hoping to see driven out at a program level is what winds up, you know, in digital. And it's just been simple things, you know, like, uh, so going back to that question about like style guides, for example, so they create their style guides, but they didn't have a whole lot of digital that was incorporated into that. So now we started to work with them so that they understand, you know, a lot more of what that looks like. They have the ability now to uh, start to influence uh, some of that as well. And then two, overall, they're starting to see what that means you know, in terms of the way that that work is shaping up uh, globally. So they have not had that ability to have that reach into digital. And we ourselves have not had that ability to have that reach back into the brand. But because of just sort of the organic way that these things have begun to shape up, um, now we're starting to work a lot more closely. And then I think everybody is able to see kind of end to end, you know, really what that means. Yeah, I love that. And then our last question to wrap things up, what's one thing you'd like attendees to walk away with from this talk? <laughs> Learn from the mistakes that we have made. Uh, so, you know, again, I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, hopefully um, you're able to kind of understand that, um, you know, you just have to think about these things, you know, uh, beyond kind of where you're at right now. Uh, like I said, we kind of took our eye off the ball a little bit, uh, realized that Figma was exploding uh, exponentially, and then that caused us to have to then go back and reconcile. And there was a lot of reconciliation uh, that really required us to start to think about, okay, we've got these groups over here. We've got to connect with them. We've got to bring them into the fold. We've got these other groups that are doing this other stuff. We need to integrate them into our workflows. And we've got these other groups that influence, you know, overall design direction. Now, how do we bring all of this together? And not only what does that look like today, but what is that going to look like tomorrow, next year, you know, that sort of thing. And so I would say for the most part, you know, uh, hopefully you're hearing in a lot of what I'm saying, you know, give some thought as to what the road ahead is going to look like. Um, you know, think about your own design teams, uh, the ways that you're currently working ways you're working with your organization, ultimately what that translates into the digital products that you're creating, and ultimately what that's gonna look like from a results standpoint, you know? So uh, one thing I kinda didn't touch a whole lot on is uh, when we talk about the effectiveness of what we're doing, uh, a lot of what uh, really kinda helps to uh, drive some things home is to be able to speak about uh, how that has resulted in the marketplace. And so when you're able to show, you know, green up arrows and a lot of, you know, positives, that's going to uh, certainly make it a lot easier for uh, getting a lot of this type of work done, because let's be honest, it is challenging, it's complex. Uh, for those of you who are designers and close to doing design work, as you know, putting yourself out in front of people every day, you're going to hear some things that you probably don't want to hear. 
uh, and that sort of thing in terms of feedback. But uh, at the end of the day, it's all intended for uh, all of us to get to a much better place. And, um, you know, again, you know, think about all these things uh, in, in context to, to your own organization and, and ultimately how you can come out uh, to be a lot more successful. And hopefully you've learned a few things that uh, we've had to figure out the hard way. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your insights, Andy. Um, just some closing statements. Um, thank you all for being an engaged audience as usual. If you dialed in later, have no fear. We'll include any links that were shared during the talk, as well as the recording in a follow-up email later this week. Um, if you enjoyed our live stream today and you want more content, you can learn about them at figma.com forward slash events. Or if you want to watch previous live streams, you can always head on over to our YouTube channel to catch them. Um, we also love hearing from our community and what they want to hear about in future live streams. So if you do have ideas or suggestions, feel free to email us at community at figma.com. And then my very last announcement, our annual user conference config is happening next month from May 10th to 11th. If you're able to join, we'd love to have you. It's free and you can register at config.figma.com. Well, that's all for me. Thank you, Andy. And thank you all for spending time with us. See you next time. Bye. Thanks, guys.